Thank you for listening to a Christ-centered message from Grace Community Church. We are committed to proclaiming the authority of God's Word without apology and trust that you will receive encouragement as we study today's passage together. Well, I welcome you this morning. We're going to go in our Bibles to Matthew chapter 5. Hopefully you have been able to download. If you're worshiping online, we welcome you. Or you have picked up a worship guide here and you will be able to put down the thoughts, the truths from this sermon from Jesus. A few weeks ago, we looked at Jesus uh, handling the subject of anger, uh, dealing with that. Last Sunday, we looked at Jesus dealing with our lust and how he took that to a whole new level from just technically not committing adultery to if you have looked with lust, you have committed adultery in your heart. And today we enter into another area that is a significant area. It can be a place of great blessing. It can also be an environment of great struggle and sorrow and difficulty, and that is marriage and divorce. Marriage and divorce. So today we're going to look at Jesus on divorce from Matthew chapter 5. Now in this past year, we're coming up to about one year ago when things began to shut down around our nation due to the COVID-19 pandemic. It has not been easy. It's been challenging. Depending on where you live, it is more challenging even than other locations. But here's what we know, all right? One year later, relationships have been pushed to the extreme, all right, due to being locked down, isolation, financial strain, uh, small business owners having to shutter their doors. How will they provide for their families? There have been all types of stress and strain on relationships, on employment, the political environment that we have witnessed over the past 12 months. It's just mind-boggling what has, what has uh, gone on. We have witnessed the rise of domestic violence and abuse. We care about this. There are people who are just at home. Okay, the longer you're at home, you know, like riding in a car to go a long trip. How Are we there yet? And you can just feel the, the simmering personalities and things rising in the vehicle. Now it's people at home getting on each other's nerves, right? Sadly and even tragically, loved ones, there have been those who have been dealing with increasing levels of depression and suicide. These have affected our relationships, the ones that in our families that we know, that we love. This has been a difficult year. And here we are as the church, right? We're the church of the living God, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we are here shining like a light. So we did our best as soon as we could open and be able to live stream and all the investment and work that was done so that if, if somebody was at home because of health, because of concerns, because of complications, because they weren't feeling well, they would not be left behind. And what has been great as a supplement to be able to worship and not be, you know, not be behind and miss out on the teaching of God's word, but listen to me, beloved, it can be no substitute for relationships. It can be no substitute for serving in the body of Christ. And the Lord has been blessing us every Sunday we have been seeing new faces. The Lord is pouring out his blessing upon our congregation and my my heart and my call as a shepherd to this con congregation and as elders is we are calling all hands on deck. If you remember here, there is opportunities for you to serve. We have to be here and be ready. The Lord is sending blessing our way and it's not gonna be, we're, well, we'll hope, hopefully we'll be ready next year. It's time now, so March 3rd, that evening, all members who are currently serving, all members, and you're looking for that place to serve, we're saying, come on, because there's a need. And God has placed you in this body of believers. If you're a member, and we're gonna be receiving members the last Sunday of this month. 
If you belong here and this is your church, there's a place that God has for you. And you have an opportunity to serve the living God in a way that no one else can serve like you. So we want to come together for one evening, eat together, share a meal together right here, and look at what God has been doing and where we're going and what what can we do as a church family and come together as we raise up leaders, as we raise up those who will serve the living God. Why? Because we have to be ready when the Lord sends a family our way and they have children. And they have a message like is given today and they need to be able to be devoted and listen to this message that could change the course of their life and their marriage. And if we're not ready, then we're saying, well, Lord, send them somewhere else. Hopefully they'll get the message there. And I don't think any member of this congregation would say, yeah, that's our mission. Then your skin has to be in the game. Your fingerprint has to be on a ministry somewhere for you to be part of the blessing and not say, oh, I missed it. And other people were there and I missed it. I don't want you to miss it. I want you to experience God working in and through your life. Now we're going back to the mountain and Jesus is dealing with some significant areas that we all wrestle with, we all deal with. Matthew chapter 5, Jesus is describing this upside down life in his kingdom. Matthew 5 and verse 31. It was also said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you, that everyone who divorces his wife except on the ground of sexual immorality makes her commit adultery. And whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. This is the word of the living God. It's a difficult word, but it's a timely word. I was reading and John Stott wrote something and I found it to be super helpful. John Stott was a single man, a single minister. He never married. And you can take it to the the next screen, and you're going to see what he said in coming to this text. He said, I confess to a basic reluctance to attempt an exposition of these verses. So he wasn't in a hurry to get on this topic. This is partly because it, divorce, is a subject which touches people's emotions at a deep level. There is almost no unhappiness so poignant as the unhappiness of an unhappy marriage. And almost no tragedy so great as the degeneration of what God meant for love and fulfillment into a non-relationship of bitterness, discord, and despair. And I agree with what he's saying here. I have no wish to add to their distress. My prayer is that God will use me as his messenger with his word to deliver that which heals, offers hope, and is actually helpful as we are sitting here in this room, all different walks of life, all different statuses of relationships. Some are young, never been married. Some are married a long time. Some are single, all different individuals right here, and my prayer is that God will offer the hope and the help through his word that you need today. You know, I never knew, I've heard the song D-I-V-O-R-C-E, Tammy Wynette, but I never knew this song. I I thought this was kind of like R-E-S-P-E-C-T, kind of like a a glamorizing, and this week that that song came to my mind. I'm thinking, I need to look up these lyrics because I, I just, you know, for whatever reason, I thought of it. But listen, she's not glamorizing divorce at all. Listen to what she says. She says, our little boy is four years old and quite a little man. So we spell out words we don't want him to understand like T-O-Y or maybe S-U-R-P-R-I-S-E. But the words we're hiding from him now tear the heart right out of me. The second verse says, watch him smile. He thinks it's Christmas or his fifth birthday. And he thinks C-U-S-T-O-D-Y spells fun or play. I spell out all the hurting words and turn my head when I speak because I can't spell away this hurt that's dripping down my cheek. 
our D-I-V-O-R-C-E becomes final today. Me, little J-O-E, will be going away. I love you both. And this will be pure H-E-double-L for me. Oh, I wish that we could stop this D-I-V-O-R-C-E. In this room, I dare say that we have all been touched by divorce, whether it be parents, marriage of parents, siblings, children. Divorce hits us in a very real way and a very difficult place. And as John Stott said, I, I wish to add no injury but to look into the word of God and find the hope and find the healing that we need. Listen to what our statement of faith says under Christian conduct. And this is on our webpage. And I just want to go through this because you want to talk about countercultural? We're, we're a rare duck, okay? This is what we say. We say this. We believe that the family the husband and wife, without or with children, is established for the education, discipline, and welfare of its members. We further maintain that God created man and woman distinct in gender, purpose, and role within the home, and that the relationship between man and wife is a most solemn picture of Christ and his church. That's where we're going with this message. That's where it ends. We stand opposed to practices which violate the biblical doctrine of the home, including divorce by which man puts asunder what God has joined together and corrupts a type of Christ. We stand opposed to promiscuity, immorality, and homosexuality, which substitutes depraved and unnatural acts of lust for the holy and undefiled expression of marital love. We stand opposed to the ordination of women which denies the fulfillment of the woman within her divinely endowed role of helper and supporter and usurps the headship and the authority of the man. We stand opposed to abortion, which is the destruction of the fruit of the womb and indeed the taking of life. We stand opposed to delinquency within the home by which parents fail to exercise godly authority and discipline over their children with whom God has entrusted to them. Okay, so who hasn't blown it somewhere in there? (laughs) Okay, if you're waiting on the person, it's like, and I have done very well on all of those, it's not going to be me, okay? So what do we do then? Wherever you are right now, whatever you've been through and wherever you're going, listen to our closing in this section. We stand ready to extend our love and ministry to those who have been victimized by the above practices which stand, we stand opposed to. And for those who have repented from such practices. The summation If any of that's been ongoing in your life, you've dealt with, it's either you've done it or it's been done to you or around you, we're here, we care. Why? Because God cares. God knows, God sees. And there's not one of us here that can throw a stone at anybody else. Well, at least I haven't done what you said there. Yeah, how you doing in every look that you give? What can then we learn from Jesus' message? What can we learn from his message that will strengthen our marriages, strengthen our relationships, that our marriages that are right now in this church, the marriages that are in preparation mode, the marriages who may be struggling right now, for those who are thinking back to difficulty in marriage that you've been, how do we make sense of this? Where do we go from here for the glory of God and the good of all peoples? That's my aim. That's my prayer is that wherever you are on this road of life, that you will say, my life from here on can be lived for the glory of God and be used for the good of all peoples. There's hope there. So we had three lessons from Jesus to encourage strong and healthy marriages for life. We're going to listen to Jesus and these will often apply as how we conduct our relationships as well, not just marriage. 
that marriage may be one of the most difficult places to apply these lessons, these truths to our life and relationship because no one knows us quite like our spouse knows us. They see it all, the good, bad, and the ugly. Number one, first lesson from Jesus, marriage is distorted when Scripture gets twisted. Marriage is distorted when Scripture gets twisted. Okay, this is a problem. It's a severe problem. Now, I will be honest with you. When 25 years ago we said I do, I thought marriage would be easy. Okay, we had 15 minutes of premarital counseling in the pastor's office there in uh, Somerset, Kentucky. And I, we, I'm like, come on, this is easy. I, I know everything I need to know. And, you know, yeah, you know, here we go. Ginger is just, I mean, she won the lottery with me, okay? This is going to be amazing. This is going to be easy. I couldn't even conceive that it's going to be a challenge at all. Yeah, I was wrong, okay? Verse 31, Jesus says, it was also said, you've heard this, you've heard this being said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. Now, if we're going to give this the way Jesus is saying, he's saying it in this way, whoever divorces his wife, just make sure you have your paperwork together. Whoever wants to get rid of their wife, just make sure you go through the technicalities, okay? And then you can be done with her and you can find that other person that really has your eye now. And immediately all of us are like, whoa, 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 whoa. I didn't catch that the first time through there. Well, that's why we come to sermons. That's why I do heavy lifting and studying through the week to bring it so that we can get our mind wrapped around to say, oh, that doesn't sound right. But that does sound like the world we live in, doesn't it? No fault. Just go our separate way. Hey, you know what many people are doing now? Just live together and don't even bother with marriage. Just live together. And that way, if it doesn't work, you know, hey, at least we're not getting divorced. We'll just function. We'll act like we're married, but we're not married. All of it is a violation of God's ordination, his institution of marriage. So we're here to pick it up out of the dirt and elevate it into its rightful place the way God sees it. Statistics say that couples who get divorced, on average, get divorced in their first eight years of, of marriage. Do you know in our nation, one divorce happens every 13 seconds? So in the time that it takes a couple to give their vows, nine divorces happen. Nearly five out of ten marriages will end Six out of ten second marriages, seven out of ten third marriages. Beloved, there is a better way. And I wish, you, I wish I could tell you that those who are Christians have a much better track record, but those who call themselves Christians really, we don't have a great record in the church either. But is that because the church is wrong? Is that because Jesus is wrong? Is that because Scripture is wrong? Or it might be that Scripture is being twisted. Therefore, marriage is distorted. The top reasons given for failed marriages, failed expectations. Lack of commitment. We argue too much. And factoring in there somewhere is unfaithfulness of one spouse that leads to the demise of the marriage. What is Jesus dealing with here? Okay, they looked for any reason to divorce. That's what's going on. They were looking for the reason. They went into saying, I'm going to find the reason. You're doing something wrong and I'm going to get rid of you. They were looking for any reason to divorce. They were twisting the Old Testament Deuteronomy 24, they're twisting it completely inside out. The command that God gave to show the devastating nature of divorce, they flipped it around and distorted it into actual permission for divorce. I have, divorce. I have my hall pass. It's okay. The exception to avoid became an excuse for men to claim. Okay, It's not been always that women had the voice that they have in our culture. In cultures around the world, it's just everything is man-centered. And that what was going, that's what was going on 2,000 years ago is women were being left out in the cold right and left. And that is not the Father's heart. 
not our Father in heaven. So Deuteronomy 24, this is the Old Testament text that they're, that they're dealing with, that Jesus deals with. When a man ta- takes a wife and marries her, if then she finds no favor in his eyes because he has found some indecency in her. Okay, there's some uh, corruption there. There's some in- infidelity or unfaithfulness. And he writes her a certificate of divorce and puts it in her hand and sends her out of his house. And she departs out of his house. Okay, so he's divorced her. He's putting her away. And if she goes and becomes another man's wife, and the latter man hates her and writes her a certificate of divorce and puts it in her hand and sends her out of his house, or if the latter man dies who took her to be his wife, then her former husband who sent her away may not take her again to be his wife after she has been defiled, for that is an abomination before the Lord. And you shall not bring sin upon the land that the Lord your God has given you for an inheritance." Now, what is the Lord saying here? He's saying to the first husband who makes the vows, don't you divorce your wife. Give the opportunity to show forgiveness, grace, love, and mercy. And if there is something where she has violated that sacred covenant and you send her away, understand you're sending her away to never get her back again. So you better think it through really, really well because it is just gonna be like, well, I gave her this certificate, never done, cancel that, bring her back. You have to take marriage much more seriously than that. That's Deuteronomy 24. But by the time that Jesus is here, things have slid down the hill much further. And that was 2,000 years ago. There were two schools of thought, all right? There there were two rabbis, and they had two schools of thought. Rabbi Shemai, all right, he taught his followers there should be no divorce, all right? He's very rigorous. We got to hold the line, no divorce, unless there's proof of infidelity. What was he doing? He was taking the word of God, interpreting, applying it. That's strict. But his school, if you divorce your wife, you better be certain of your decision because you can't have her back. And that fits with Deuteronomy 24. That's one school of thought. There was another rabbi, Rabbi Hillel, and he taught his followers, divorce is okay so long as you have all your paperwork in order. The husband then could legally get rid of his wife if she was displeasing to him in any way. And we're going to see this show up in a few moments in Matthew 19. And the phrase is, for any reason. And when they said for any reason, they meant any reason. Mess up on my meal, I'll give you a certificate. You got it sitting right over here. All I need to do, sign it, and I'm sending you packing. Okay, now, now, we can make light of that a little bit, but no, we shouldn't because that meant where are they going to go? They've already been given away. Now where are they going to go? They're going to have to marry someone. 2,000 years ago, that culture, they're not going to just go get a job somewhere. They don't have a degree from anywhere. Now what are they going to do and who cares about them? I'll tell you who. God does and he still cares. And whenever men abdicate their responsibility to love and to lead, the ones that we were called to protect get hurt. They get left out. So this is God's protection. And and we hear it like, oh, that's so strict. Until you're the one and the paper's sitting over there and you're just always on the line of being put away. Then you're like, wait, wait, wait a second. There's a God who is over you, Mr. Mr. Husband. And you're going to stand before him one day and you're going to give account of how you have handled what he has given to you. Now, Joseph, he had a legitimate reason that he could have said, I need that, I need that certificate of divorce, please. The woman that he was betrothed to, which is officially married, although they hadn't consummated them, their vows yet, shows up pregnant And he wasn't willing to to mob her. He wasn't willing to expose her and embarrass her. He loved Mary. And so he was debating, I guess I'm going to need to get the certificate of divorce because that's not my child. And I'm not going to say it's okay, it's, it's, it's all right, and I'll just hide her sin. There's something wrong here. And then the angel comes, hey, hey, Joseph, it's okay. You can shred that thing up. You don't need it because Mary didn't, she wasn't unfaithful to you. She wasn't unfaithful to her vows. She hasn't been fooling around behind your back. You can marry her. This is of God. And can you imagine the relief that Joseph would have experienced? 
whew, I thought she loved me. Whoa, I wasn't ready for that. You know, this just in, your wife is going to give birth to Messiah. He didn't have that on his to-do list in the morning when he woke up that day. But God did. But that's a case that Joseph could have legitimately said, I'm going to put you away because that's not my baby you're carrying. But he didn't. So they're looking for any reason. Joseph, he wasn't. And when the reason was given why Mary was pregnant, he said, whoa, there's the reason I need. I'm going to marry her. Come on, let's go. We're headed to Bethlehem. They were looking for any reason to divorce. And then beyond that, take it up a notch. They wanted God's blessing on their divorce. Now, beloved, not much has changed in 2,000 years. They're saying, I don't want permission. I don't need forgiveness. And actually, I want you, preacher man, to go ahead and say it's okay for me to be divorced. There's some reasons I've been given for couples who are pursuing divorce during my time in ministry. In the community, in church, ministry, I've heard it told me, you know, people have said to me, you know what, we got divorced and it's so much better now because the kids don't see us arguing anymore. So much better. Not true. Not true. I've had couples say, you know what, counseling didn't work for us. We tried counseling, didn't work. So we're getting divorced. Instead of saying, help me do whatever I can do that is right in the sight of God to save my marriage. Nope, mine's made up. Like, well, you know, the church doesn't offer enough counseling. What do you think this is every week from this pulpit? We either listen and apply or we just close it off and we look to blame someone else for our issues. There's a better way, beloved. Marriage is distorted when scripture is twisted. Second lesson from Jesus, marriage is protected when scripture is rightly understood. So Jesus is going to say, let me clear this up for you. Let me give you the message that you need so that you hear the truth about Deuteronomy 24. And for Jesus, for those who love the word of God, for those who love what God creates, this is a priority. This isn't, well, we'll get around to it. This is a priority for us. But I say to you, verse 32, that everyone who divorces his wife except on the ground of sexual immorality makes her commit adultery, and whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Beloved, marriage is a covenant. The vows given by a bride and a groom, a husband and a wife are sacred. We trace our roots all the way back to the garden, the first and last ever perfect marriage, Adam and Eve. And God put Adam to sleep and performed the first surgery, took from his rib, and from that rib made a woman and woke him up. Is it a dream? I mean, I've been looking at elephants and I've been looking at giraffes and hamsters and monkeys and this one here looks like me but way better. I mean, whoa, right? That, that, that's the old joke. Whoa, man, right? The whoa, right there. There she is, woman from man. And what did God do in the garden? He held the first wedding. And he gave that, that significant moment in a wedding when a bride's hand is transferred generally from the father to the groom to say, I've brought her all this way. I've loved her, protected her, raised her protected her purity, and I'm bringing to her to you. The responsibility is now yours. And the authority of protection, love, and grace transfers from the father to a husband, and that responsibility all sets in the moment that hand is transferred. 
an invitation into the struggle of blessing and burden of someone knowing you and you knowing them and you both needing to constantly turn to the Lord for help that you don't have on your own. And there, the first wedding and Eve is given to Adam. And like I said, that's the first and last marriage that was ever perfect. No fights, no arguments until. How about that fruit? And that relationship was covered in shame moments later. And the first evidence of sin is hiding from one another and hiding from God. And the temptation that we all face is to run from God and run away from accountability and just put people around us that will tell us what we want to hear. Actually, I want God's blessing on my disobedience. He won't do it. And the church shouldn't do it either. Not if we're going to be pleasing to him. Marriage is a covenant. The Pharisees were preoccupied with grounds for divorce. How close to the line can we get and still be okay? Jesus is concerned and preoccupied with marriage. The husband, the wife, the family, the children, the community. That's love. And Jesus is concerned with that. And it fits. This is clearly communicated in the Old and New Testament. Malachi chapter 2, verse 13. The Lord was taking his people to court. And they were so stubborn. Aren't you glad that we're not stubborn like they are? You know, they were so stubborn. And this is the second thing you do. You cover the Lord's altars with, altar with tears, with weeping and groaning because he no longer regards the offering or accepts it with favor from your hand. But you say, here comes the blame. Why does he not? Because the Lord was witness between you and the wife of your youth to whom you have been faithless. Though she is your companion and your wife by covenant, did he not make them one with a portion of the Spirit in their union? And what was the one God seeking? Godly offspring. So guard yourselves in your spirit and let none of you be faithless to the wife of your youth. For the man who does not love his wife but divorces her, says the Lord, the God of Israel, covers his garment with violence, says the Lord of hosts. So, Guard yourselves in your spirit and do not be faithless. The Lord hates divorce. Divorce hurts. It does damage. They were looking for excuses, for reasons. It's okay. But divorce, according to the word of God, is only permissible in cases of infidelity unfaithfulness. If the, if the vows were broken, then there may be a cause for divorce. But if there's not a command that someone must divorce their unfaithful partner, though they be deeply wounded and hurt. Hebrews 13, 4 says, let marriage be held in honor among all and let the marriage bed be undefiled for God will judge the sexually immoral and adulterous. Beloved, God takes our purity so seriously. And he, here's a way you can hear this. Man, God just doesn't want me to do what I want to do, and he doesn't want me to be fulfilled. You're missing it. He loves you better than you love you. He loves your loved ones better than you love them. And he's provided the place for their protection, provision and his presence in their lives. And so much hinges on this inner battle that we talked about last week and what we're dealing with this week. Now in Matthew 19, Jesus, and you, I want you to turn there in your Bibles, Matthew 19, the Pharisees come to Jesus and, and this is the issue that John the Baptist was beheaded over. He confronted Herod and his unlawful marriage, 
And Herod's wife, who used to be his brother's wife, took issue with it and waited for the opportunity. And eventually he had the opportunity and had his head chopped off and brought on a platter. Ew, all right, gross. So much hatred that she had. So in Matthew 19, we see when Jesus, this question is brought up and he expands broader than he did in the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew 19, verse 1, now, when Jesus had finished these sayings, he went away from Galilee and entered a region, the region of Judea beyond the Jordan. And large crowds followed him and he healed them there. And Pharisees came up to him and tested him by asking, is it lawful to divorce one's wife for any cause? There it is, for any reason, any cause. He answered, have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female? And said, therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. They said to him, thank you for clearing that up. We appreciate that. We didn't see it that way. No. Aha. Why then did Moses command one to give a certificate of divorce and to send her away? You hear how they flip that around? It's like Moses is, hurry up, get divorced already. Just make sure you have that certificate in hand. He said to them, because of the hardness of your heart, Moses allowed you to divorce your wives. But from the beginning, it was not so. So you rascals wouldn't commit murder. He made a provision, an exception. Verse 9, and I say to you, that sounds familiar, doesn't it? Whoever divorces his wife except for, here's this clause, sexual immorality and marries another commits adultery. Now right about here, the disciples pull the wrestling move got to tap out. That's uh, Seriously, Jesus? Which school are you? We were hoping you might be somewhere. You What? The disciples said to him, if such is the case of a man with his wife, it's better not to marry. That's what I was thinking, James. Yeah, good luck, Peter. You're already married. Man, maybe I should have waited. But he said to them, not everyone can receive this saying, but only those to whom it is given. For there are eunuchs who have been made so from birth. There are eunuchs who have been made eunuchs by men. And there are eunuchs who have made themselves eunuchs like Origen did. We talked about that last week. For the sake of the kingdom of heaven. And the church said, no, don't do that. Let the one who is able to receive this, receive it. There are some people who are gifted with singleness. And Jesus doesn't elevate to say, now they are really the spiritual ones and all you other people that have to get married. No, no, he doesn't dishonor marriage and he makes a place, makes a provision that someone may actually, like Paul was saying, I'm okay single. I'll live in a wartime mentality and when the Lord sends me here or when the Lord sends me there or when my head goes rolling down the hill, there won't be a wife and children standing nearby watching me. And I'm okay with that. I'm complete in Christ. The Apostle Paul, he addressed the permanency of marriage, 1 Corinthians 7, and he says in verse 10, to the married I give this charge and he's saying, I'm quoting the Lord here, not I but the Lord. The wife should not separate from her husband. Jesus said that, but I say to you. Verse 11, but if she does, she should remain unmarried or else be reconciled to her husband and the husband should not divorce his wife. Verse 39, a wife is bound to her husband as long as he lives, but if her husband dies, she is free to be married to whom she wishes only in the Lord. Marry a believer. If the Lord provides and put yourself under someone who will love and shepherd you like Jesus, not anybody else. So the teaching of Scripture is clear. And wherever you are on the road of life today, the Lord will meet you there. Right where you are. 
Third lesson from Jesus, marriage is enjoyed when Scripture is humbly applied. Marriage is enjoyed when Scripture is humbly applied. I put the word humbly in there for me because that could absolutely describe much conflict in our early years of marriage. Oh, I had the Scripture. I had the words. I had the, I had the laws and laws and laws and rules. Missing grace. But God is faithful. This is a promise from God. And do not misunderstand this. It's not a promise that everything will be easy. But it's a promise that you can have a joy that surpasses trials, sorrow, difficulty. That joy abides in all of that. Marriage is enjoyed when Scripture is humbly applied. So what then is God's design for marriage? What is his intention? And I'm just going to give five words, five descriptions, and the first one is love. Love. Remember, this is the opposite of lust last week. We looked at that. This is for love, love that serves, love that gives, love that sacrifices, love that forgives. When spouses love, when they serve, when they forgive one another, this is the kind of love that is God's love. And this love is then going to be evident to children and to those who come into their home and to neighbors. And as far as their influence will go, people will see there's something different about this couple. What is it? I mentioned last week, one of the changing, the significant moments in my life that God used in, in a small group in Illinois, personal holiness, times of temptation, those guys, about five of us, where for the first time, I just didn't pre- just be youth pastor, it's all great, but I could get with men who loved God and we could lift our eyes to our Father in heaven and bring what was ugly into the sight to deal with it. Well, here is about 10 years ago, we, a group of husbands and wives, went through this study by Alistair Begg, Lasting Love. And no one took this from me in the first service. I said they could have first dibs. This is a copy you can have as a CD with all the sermons. And if you want it, it's right here. And to take this copy after service does not mean that you are like, look at Jay. All right. And we sold. All right, Jay, that's your copy. Listen, these sermons are online. They're excellent. He does one sermon, his Uncle Ali. I think he's at Cedarville University, and he's talking to those who are approaching marriage. And I love to hear the refreshing sound of people who are honest and authentic, and they point your eyes to heaven. They point your eyes to the cross. And you know what, why I bring this up? is because the couples that we went through, that study together, that was another moment in our lives, husband, wife, to... Get with those in like-minded, in a setting, and say, let's encourage one another. And I wish that I could tell you that everybody in that gathering took everything to heart. Some spouses did, some spouses did not. But God is faithful. God is faithful. As I said it last week, God cares. And I'm thankful for those individuals who we spent that time. That was valuable time. And we have moments like that that happen in our small groups all the time. I wouldn't do life any other way than living in community. I've been there and done that. And it, it's no good. Sucks the life out of you. Let's you try to pretend that it's all great when in the Lord knows and you know it's not. Love. What does Paul write in 1 Corinthians 13? Just listen to this. It's often said at weddings, love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. Oh, I was really good at that. It is not irritable and resentful. Yep, scored pretty high there too. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. Then he, then he describes the things that are passing away. As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, the spiritual gift, they will cease. They will do away with themselves. As for knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. 
When I was a child, I spoke as a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I gave up childish ways. And that'll tell you where you are in, in, in your life, men. That says where we are. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. So now faith, hope, and love abide. I remember the girls' trio wearing those shirts, faith, hope, love, right? These three, but the greatest of these is love. This is written to a church. This is to be experienced in our lives. This is to be like a, a well of refreshment to those who come near us. Not that the, we act like we're perfect and we have it all together, but that we go to the one who is perfect and he's the one who puts us all together again. Another excellent resource. We have a little pamphlet, small of these around. What Did You Expect by Paul David Tripp. It's got a great series that could be like what we went through in this if there were others interested in doing that. What did you expect? Listen to what he says after a whole section on confession, like bringing your junk to be dealt with instead of putting it under another rug as if that's ever worked. Listen to what he says. He says, when the shadow of the cross hangs over our marriage, we live in re and relate differently. We are no longer afraid to look at ourselves. We are no longer surprised by our sin. We no longer have to work to present ourselves as righteous. We say goodbye to finger pointing and self-excusing. We abandon our record of wrongs, and I'm good at keeping that. We settle issues quickly. And we do all these things because we know that everything we need to confess has already been forgiven. And what is needed for every new step we will take has already been supplied. We can live in the liberating light of humility and honesty. A needy and tender sinner living with a needy and tender sinner no longer defensive, and no longer afraid, together growing nearer to one another as we grow to be more like him. Now, who wouldn't want a marriage like that? That's God's design. It's a love that never ends, and it's only found in Christ Purity is our next word of description that God's design for marriage is for purity. Purity before God, purity with one another, upholding the sanctity of marriage. Marriage is not to be forbidden. Oh, you want to go into the ministry? Then you have to be single. That's not from heaven. That's not from God. No human being can forbid someone else to be married. It's God's gift to all humanity, not just Christians, not just through a church. It's humanity. It goes all the way back to the garden. There are some who may have the gift of singleness, but that's not a super spiritual person compared to those who are married. God's blessing, God's favor, God's presence abides and rests in all situations. God's design is for love, for purity, for life. That's what marriage is to be. As in for all of life, your whole life, till death do us part. And do you know last year we celebrated with Dave and Jan Helzer, their 50th anniversary. Uh, we celebrated not only with them, but with Mike and Judy Masterson, their 50th anniversary. This coming October, Jill and Jeff Manor will celebrate their 50 years October 15th. You know what a treasure that is? You know how awesome that is that we get to be part of? Do you know what it is to be selfless? It's to be able to rejoice in someone else's success and God's faithfulness in their lives. And not long ago, Russ and I were talking to Mike and Judy, and we were kidding about this. I said, yeah, it's all been easy and bliss. And he said, <laughs> right, because he's been there. 
He understands it's God's grace, it's his mercy, it's his faithfulness. So Jesus would say in Matthew 19, 6, they're no longer two but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. Stop trying to look for the way out. Look for the way up in forgiveness and love and serving. Look for that way. There's a better way. For life, for babies. We had some babies running around here in the first service. It was a lively place. This is God's gift. Our team is working on preparing so that we're ready. We're you know what we're saying? We have babies being announced like all the time. There's another baby on the way, another baby on the way. I said it last week somewhere. We better build a nursery. Oh, yeah, we are right down the road where there'll be room. And the kids will be able to stay in there. And the, you, know what, you know what we want? We want the place to be, when you're a kid and you're this big, you can't wait to get in that room. We're part of this. God's going to give us this. Marriage is for good. To live in God's goodness. To experience God's goodness and to share his goodness with one another in the world. This is what Jesus is saying. Let your light shine. That these testimonies of brokenness and healing and being restored that God is doing and when other people come in and they find our homes to be a safe place, a haven, a place that they love to come. And it's not because we're perfect and it's not because everything is just in its place and don't mess anything up. I like that. It doesn't work that way. But may God allow there to be something refreshing about our homes. And lastly, for God's glory. God's design for marriage for life is for God's glory. And to enter into marriage thinking, now this person will complete me, and this person will never leave me, and this person will never offend me, and this person will never let me down. That is a God-sized burden you're putting on a human being. They can't hold it. They cannot bear up under that weight. Marriage is a reflection of Christ and his church, of his never-ending love for his bride, and if you look at that list that you've just written down, God's design for marriage, love, purity, life, good, God's glory, which one of those does Satan love? He hates them all. So it's not just your spouse and you that are the problem. There's someone that hates you and hates what marriage represents. So no matter who you are or where you are at, we care about you. We love you. We want God to use us to encourage you. I want Ginger to come up here. She helped me in the first hour, and I want her to come. Sometimes you hear from my voice, and, you know, I don't like the sound of my own voice. But when you hear from someone else's perspective, and you're like, well, let's, let's, let's investigate this a little bit, all right? Let's look at this. Let's kind of pop the hood and let's look at how is God's glory displayed in marriage, all right? And I'm just, I just want Ginger just to share a word of encouragement to a wife who may be struggling, all right, to give hope to them that things can change. <laughs> they are changing. All right, so I just want you to share a little bit. Um, you did great in the first hour, so. Thank you. Um. So, I'll let you back. Oh, okay, good. I think um, Brian touched on it a little bit, but I think mainly what happens in new marriages and um, when you first go into it is you have these expectations that are not reality. I don't think I had that many expectations personally. I'm a pretty, you know, I, I just went into marriage wanting somebody that loved me for me, you know? And I think Brian probably had more unrealistic expectations of me when we got married. So we went straight into the ministry, and what I think happened was we just stayed really busy, really, really busy. And um, that didn't really give a lot of 
time to actually build our relationship. And I think I was thinking, <laughs> I remember once um, we were just married and we were at the grocery store and I was right <laughs> I was right behind Brian with the cart, and of course, I ran into his Achilles, Achilles tendon, you know, whatever. And you know, drama, okay, comes out of him. And, and I remember thinking, dude, there's going to be a lot more of these where I hit you because that is just that's me. true. I am so I don't know if you know us very well, but we're very opposite, and um, <laughs> I think that you know, I needed somebody that would just love me, even though. I'm going to probably run over your foot again or do something, uh, be late, you know, that, that, mm -hmm. that's me. So I think what happens is, is Brian probably came in with a little more legalism and you're now, you know, mine and you're my wife and, and you do you've what I pastor's say. wife. You've pastor's wife. So my encouragement to women, I actually would rather talk to the men first and, um, We've all heard, you know, the verse, women, wives, submit yourself to your husband. And, of course, that's scripture, and it's true. But I think at one point um, we heard a message, and, you know, we didn't just kind of like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's more you go to the next step, and it's husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. And, oh, yeah, I love her. It's not that. If you really think about it, he died for the church. Mm -hmm. And if you love your wife the way that Christ loves the church, you love her no matter what you deal with her and understanding. You, we're very different creatures, so you, you, you take that into consideration in all things. And if you do that, it's not hard for the wife to submit to the husband because that's how God planned it. I think sometimes, especially in Christian homes, the men take it out of context and they've been taught that. That's not anything that I'm pointing fingers or blame. I think it gets taught wrongly and it leaves the wife feeling um, underappreciated or just an object and no value at all. And that is not the way God intended it. And so in any marriage, um, wherever you are in that journey together. I, I, we, we talked about this in small group, which is amazing because we all do, we split up and we share. And, um, you know, sometimes you just need to know that somebody else has got the same feeling or had the same feeling or has gone through this. But you, you, you go through life and really usually what we fight about, it's not usually those big things. It's those little small things. It's that little, you are literally getting on my nerves so bad right now. Or if you chomp on that cereal one more time, <laughs> I'm coming out of my seat, right? It's those little things and you, you, it adds up. But what, what happens is we just get stubborn and we get defensive and it takes one person, one or the other, to just say, you know what, I messed up. And then to realize it and then not do it again and then you, it just diffuses the situation because in my heart of hearts, you don't, we don't have to be in marriages that we just endure. Mm -hmm. We can enjoy our lives together, you can enjoy your children, you can enjoy your time together, and you don't have to have like, oh, it's all have to be perfect. There are gonna be bumps in the road, there are gonna be trials, there's gonna be real life, but you can enjoy each step. Mm -hmm. And I think we're just kind of conditioned sometimes to be like, oh, yep, you know, I'm married, whatever. It, it doesn't have to be that way. You have all the tools to enjoy it, and most, the, the biggest tool is just that grace and just saying I'm sorry and moving on and not having that list of wrongs mm -hmm. and showing that grace. And, you know, it, it's, it's life-changing. It's very, very simple, mm -hmm. but it's life-changing. And I think that um, that is the, the main component. Yeah. I think if uh, early on, if you would ask, like, you know, uh, now, men, make sure you love your wives as, as the Lord loves the church. I would have told you I am. 
and she's just not recognizing how great of a job I'm doing. I mean, all of the youth group and all these things are going so great, and she, she's just not getting with the program fast enough here. And we can laugh about it now because, not because here we are, and this, I'm telling you, it's God's grace. It's God's grace. It's his grace. And that is available, like, for all of us. And this is what we are to be as a church, is not glorifying self. It's we can tell others, come with me to Jesus. Whatever your need is, whether you are single, whether you are married, whether you've been divorced, whether you've caused the divorce or you were hurt by a divorce, unfaithfulness, a widow, widower, whatever, wherever you are in life, God will meet you right there, right there. He cares. And you're sitting in a place where people, we love you. We care about you. God is the only one who will never let us down and never fail us. And early on, my desires, and we talked about it last week, turned into demands. That's where, that's where I failed repeatedly. Instead of letting desires be fueled to devotion and service, and I'm thankful for, I've said it, my wife, I'm thankful for my family, I'm thankful for my church family because this is our story. That's the difference. It's not, here's our story, what's your story? This is our story. And God is doing a mighty work. And I am thankful. And God has given me thankfulness that used to be just, keeping that record, keeping that list. And it was my list. It wasn't God's list. It was my list. And I just want to read what Paul wrote. Ginger mentioned it. As he writes Ephesians 5, and he says this, and just think about God's view of marriage. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its Savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives. How much? As Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word so that he might present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself for no one ever hated his own flesh but nourishes it and cherishes it just as Christ does the church because we are members of his body. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I am saying that it refers to Christ and his church. You think, wait, I thought this was all about marriage. The greater marriage is Jesus and his church, and if you belong to him, you're part of that. And it's going to play out in our relationships. However, verse 33, let each one of you love his wife as himself and let the, church, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. That's it right there. If you sum down all of marital counseling, love your wife, respect your husband in a way that pleases God and see what God will do in your marriage, in your family, in your future. God's plan is a greater plan. Now you think about this, this I'm, I'm gonna pull up the summary and then we're gonna pray. And, and we are here for you and we love you. The three lessons from Jesus. Marriage is distorted when scripture gets twisted. Marriage is protected when scripture is rightly understood. And marriage is enjoyed when scripture is humbly applied. It's a promise from the Lord Jesus. If we take him at his word, do you remember the vows? For better or for worse? 
richer for poor, sickness and in health. Keep ourselves only unto her, only unto him, so long as you both shall live. How are we doing on keeping our vows? And this sets us up for next week's sermon. Are we people of our word? Oh, I pray that we experience the grace and mercy. Can we see how countercultural this is? Do you see how different this is than the world that we live in? That's by design. And it's God's design. So what's your next step? What's your next step? And what's your next step in relationships and growing in authenticity and love and serving? I'm going to ask Ginger to pray. And we're praying for you. We're praying for those who are online, for our church family. We're praying for marriages. And then I'm going to pray. And then we're going to respond in worship and in singing before we give our offerings today. Let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, um, we just come to you and first of all, just thankfulness for the people that you provide in our lives, Lord. Lord, I thank you for our church family and they are my family and I just thank you so much for the relationships, Lord, that you give us. I pray, Lord, for the marriages in this um, church and um, all the people that each family represents, Lord. I just ask that you would protect those homes. Um, help each person, husband, wife, to be brave enough to be authentic and honest and give each person grace in their response to the other. Um, I pray that you would just bless those homes, Lord, bless, bless those children um, in the future marriages that come from that. Lord, help us to be different here than other places and not just to be an act, Lord. I just pray that we are displaying your holiness and grace through our lives. I also pray for those who are single or aren't in a relationship, Lord, help everyone know that each person has a role. And if there's a future spouse for that person or future relationships, friendships, Lord, I just ask that you would just give each person wisdom and protection in that as well, Lord, and, and that they would seek wise counsel and follow that, Lord. And I thank you for your word and how it provides the path that we need to take, Lord, in everything that we do. Help us not to mess it up, to make it say what we want it to say, just to fit what we want at that moment, Lord. Help us not to be selfish, to do all that um, honors you in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Father, as this message comes to a close, our lives continue on. And I pray for healing that is needed, for hearts that have been broken. By loved ones who have walked away. God, I pray to your spirit was so move in power and in love and in grace that we who are here, that we will be your hands and feet. I pray for the, the fatherlessness in our nation, God. I pray for men. I thank you for the women. So often it's the women who are here and they're seeking after you and men struggle at leading in love their families, God, and I pray that you will equip and strengthen men to be men of grace, character, holiness, righteousness, protecting their families, serving their families, serving your church, Lord. I thank you for what you are doing. 
And I cry out to you, Lord, for we need and we want to be a blessing to those who are around us. So fill us with your joy. Fill us with your spirit. Save those who do not know Christ. They can't. This is a whole picture of Christ's love for his church, Lord. It's marriage. So God, I pray that people will come to know you and worship you. Bind up the brokenhearted. Strengthen the weak. For the glory and honor of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Thank you again for listening to Teaching from the Word at Grace Community Church. We are located in Richmond, Michigan. You can find us online at mygracechurch.com. Please subscribe and follow us at My Grace Church. It would be greatly appreciated if you would take a moment to rate, like, and share this message. We want you to always remember that you are loved.